Today is a new beginning of a new year for the for the academic and the uh, clinical folks in this institution, and we are very fortunate today to have beginning uh, the conference uh, series, Dr. Bill Zogby, who obviously needs no introduction, but I'd like to tell you a, a thing or two about uh, Dr. Zogby. He's been here about 30 some odd years now, having gone through the training program here at Methodist in cardiology and then echocardiography. And he and Dr. Kononis and Dr. Nage have pretty much written the, the books on the intravascular study, intracardiac study of uh, the heart, pressures and valves. And I don't think there's anybody uh, better, better suited than Dr. Zogby to talk to you about imaging, the imaging uh, conferences and institute of this institution. Uh, th through the years, he has risen steadily through the academic ranks of this institution, of Baylor, and of the American College of Cardiology, and uh, several years ago served as uh, president of the college. And since then, he has uh, become now chairman of the Department of Cardiology, uh, <coughs> succeeding Dr. Canones. He's also chair of the World Health Organization uh, uh, Conference on uh, Cardiovascular Medicine, and uh, he's going to he's going to uh, talk this morning about the imaging uh, future. Uh, I don't think anybody can better talk to us about it than him. He is uh, serves. He has. He serves as the Elkins Family Distinguished Chair in, in, in Cardiac Health in the Department of Cardiology. Uh, he and he. The, so this morning, let me introduce Bill. And uh, you'll have to look out for the water up here on the <laughs> on the dais that I spill for you. Thank you, Bill. You. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your nice introduction. Uh, I'm, basically, I'm honored that Dr. Winters introduced me this morning. Uh, an amazing individual who's uh, shepherded us through the years in cardiovascular medicine. And uh, I was thinking of what topic should I share with you at the beginning of this academic year. We could have talked about the vision of cardiology and I think you'll hear it throughout the year as to where do we want to go. Uh, but it is almost the anniversary of a decade that we've put together this Cardiovascular Imaging Institute. And imaging touches each one of you involved in healthcare, but particularly in cardiovascular medicine. It is said nowadays that you cannot be a cardiologist or even a cardiovascular investigator without being knowledgeable. You don't have to be an expert, but you have to be quite knowledgeable in imaging because you would have a much better feel of structure and function of the heart and the vessels as you tackle whatever disease or whatever investigation you're trying to do. So what I thought of doing is give you a feel of where we are now and what are some of the trends that you will see within the next five years or so, some of the challenges? There won't be too much data, so you don't have to take too many notes. Uh, but it is an exciting field. It really is amazing. And if you look through the history, many of you here who have been around for some time uh, lived for a while with the first three on you know, the EKG and echocardiogram and some nuclear techniques. But with the advent of CT, with the advent of MRI, things are really quite different nowadays. And you have this multimodality imaging, and I think the word multimodality will probably gradually fade away, and we'll talk about cardiovascular imaging with all the tools that you have to try to understand disease, investigate disease, 
and hopefully manage patients better for a better outcome. And there is not a single area in cardiovascular medicine that imaging does not touch. From function to disease of the vessels, congenital heart disease, a new area of guiding intervention or interventional imaging, believe it or not, vascular disease, all these have been really amazing. And it's good when you talk about the future to learn something from the past. This is the history of echocardiography up till recently. The amazing thing to me is that the principle is exactly the same. You send sound, you reflect it back, you ask a different question, and therefore you look at structure, you look at function, you look at uh, gradients and so many things. And, and it really has sustained innovation over the years. And uh, there is still sustained innovation, believe it or not, in echocardiography. And it has developed into a family of techniques that nowadays we may take for granted. Uh, but it is really a first because it is very cost effective. It is a first modality most of the time to evaluate the cardiovascular individual. And uh, the trend nowadays is, one, 3D has become quite important. So uh, it is not anymore a theoretical thing. It really has evolved over time. Uh, if you look at the newer trends, besides newer technology, uh, you, you're going to see quite a bit of automation that we have not seen in the past with the power of computers nowadays. And remember this word machine learning is going to come through several of these. It's not only for echocardiography. Believe it or not, this is for medicine. Looking ahead for the next 10 years of where you're going to be. And this is not to replace an individual. It's really to help an individual make decisions and have a wider picture because in a way we're limited as to how much information can we tackle, can we put together, but still there is this clinical acumen that comes together. For echocardiography as opposed to many other imaging modalities, miniaturization is amazingly powerful. And you will see this that, you know, from miniaturization to big machines, uh, this is the versatility that you can get in multimodality imaging training. So if you take a look at, at uh, this uh, image basically here, this is 3D echocardiography. And nowadays, you know, uh, technology has improved so much that you could really take a look at the heart, and we call them volumes per seconds, almost real time, actually, that you could take a look at that. Very powerful, particularly with higher imaging transesophageal to guide technology or to evaluate disease. But it's really amazing that you can almost see the heart in front of you uh, to help you diagnose as well help the surgeon at times uh, do an intervention, repair a valve, or, or tackle a certain issue. For those of you also who've tackled uh, the issue of how do you quantitate ventricular function, uh, which is always a, an interesting thing, uh, I think gradually we're moving not away, but complementing ejection fraction as a volumetric evaluation of ventricular function. This is strain or strain imaging. For those of you who've lived in the days of M mode, this is basically almost thickening of the heart, but thickening of the heart in different vectors. So this is the longitudinal vector, and you hear about global longitudinal strain, which is a measure of ventricular function, more sensitive than ejection fraction for changes. Uh, you hear about cardio-oncology, and this will be a big program, actually, we'll be instituting this year in collaboration with our cancer center uh, to have a better surveillance of heart function, particularly in individuals who get cardiotoxic drugs. But it is a quantitative measure, and you could see it there on the, on the right side of how you can quantitate regional function, and this is fully automated going forward. You could take it to even a different level, not only quantitate strain and thickening, if you will, deformation of the heart, but you could look on the right side at what's called torsion. Now, it's still trying to find its place as to what we can understand about torsion and health and disease, but as you know that the heart doesn't just thicken, but at the same time while it's thickening, there is a torsion motion, there is a twist motion of the heart, 
uh, that may be exaggerated in certain situations, and certainly in ventricular depression, it will, uh, it will be much more altered. Diastolic dysfunction will alter it. Uh, has not yet found a niche for clinical application, but I think it's still very important. This is the first slide I'm, I'll share with you about what is the area for the future. The area for the future of development is how do you, how do you put to, together complex data? And indeed, beyond, behind, behind all these imaging modalities that you see, there is tremendous complexity. There's so much data, digital data, that is available. And how do you, can you put it together besides us with our pair of eyes trying to interpret either an echocardiogram or an MRI or a CT scan? And there are various ways to do that. You could see them here on the slide. Clinical, biochemical, genomics, you know about networks and various areas in genomics, but also there are some feature recognition, data mining, machine learning, where actually you train a certain machine of how to interpret and, and, and come up with either a quantitative measure, how do you track the endocardium, uh, all these automated areas that, that you could do that. And uh, there are a lot of investigations. So it's not only, it's not only uh, the, the realm of um, industry that is developing that. There are a lot of individuals who are spending a lot of time on machine learning going forward. This is from Mount Sinai. Um, Dr. Sengupta has been pioneering this along with Jagat Narula. And uh, this is uh, machine learning of how do you track an echocardiogram. It's not only for the ventricle, it's also for the atrium. And uh, not only that, actually what, what you're going to look at possibly is not only volumes, but also all the diastolic parameters that we usually use. E, E prime, velocity, strain, and so many other things. So conceivably from an echocardiogram that you obtain, you could send it through a machine that has learned some of these patterns and come up with an interpretation for you, not to replace you, but to guide you along. And we know that there's a lot of variability among individuals and in interpretation, so hopefully that will conceivably increase accuracy, decrease variability, and hopefully come up with, with better overall interpretation. Uh, CT scans have uh, have been able to segment the heart much better than echocardiography, but you see the same trend almost anywhere. This is from Roberto Lang's work, and he's been pioneering this as to uh, you can identify, automate cardiac chambers. This is a recent publication uh, just this year uh, from Cognitive Learning, looking at cardiac imaging for differentiating constrictive pericarditis from restrictive cardiomyopathy, looking at various parameters, and they are you know, the diastolic bounce, the filling parameters, and so many other things that you can put together, and you have to remind yourself as an echocardiographer what to look for. Conceivably, machine learning can help you put things together and alert you to a certain situation, and believe it or not, the validation looked very promising, very, very promising going forward. Now, we use imaging to help, obviously, the clinician trying to identify, you know, um, pathologic conditions or early detection, but this is in the realm of heart failure. Just looking at an image can give you an, quite an idea as to what the underlying etiology is, from a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to a dilated one, to most likely an infiltrative disease in the left lower there, and somebody with a lot of regional abnormalities that you, you suspect uh, most likely an ischemic etiology, or it could be myocarditis, but most of the time, uh, this is what it is. So you help the individual as to which direction is the workup going and how do you treat an individual. And this is part and parcel of what we do in clinical medicine, and that won't change. Another thing that won't change is our power to uh, investigate diastolic dysfunction that is becoming more and more ubiquitous as the aging population and comorbidities occur. Uh, a lot of individuals with normal, quote-unquote, heart function, but they come in with heart failure. They have a lot of diastolic dysfunction. And uh, this is pioneering work from our colleague, Dr. Naga, director of the Ecolab. Uh, 20 years ago, Dr. Naga. Uh, 20 years ago, actually, this is, you know, this is in the guideline that 
he wrote himself also, but certainly used throughout the world as to how do you evaluate diastolic function uh, with echocardiography. Where I see the future going is that beyond this, in a way, simplistic way of looking at diastole, looking at what, what happens at the annular level of the mitral valve, is that you know, this is a global index as opposed to a regional index. And can we go from global, from regional to global? And I think this is what you're going to see down the line, hopefully, with improvement in vector imaging, spectral imaging, that uh, this concept of relaxation of the heart uh, not only be applied at the annular level, but also throughout the myocardium. CMR has been uh, amazing, I think, over the past few years. I think uh, when we brought Dr. Deepan Shah here, uh, I always say that whenever I go, is that we had the machine. We had what we needed from a technology point of view. Yet our utilization of MRI, I can tell you these are real numbers, was about 22 studies per year. And it's not because of a turf between radiology and cardiology. It's just we did not get what you needed from the information that you sent a patient for. The images were not optimized. You could not answer the question. And you bring somebody, and this, is, this would apply to any area of cardiology or even medicine, you bring somebody with expertise and interest to try to develop it further. This program has grown to about 3,000 plus studies per year, not because of overutilization, all of them are really appropriate, is just trying to understand better the disease, image it better, interact with the clinician, and I think we are the envy of, of uh, you know, many programs in the country where, you know, competing with the highest programs here, uh, you know, at Duke and, and Northwestern as to what you could, you know, produce with MRI. And MRI is, is amazingly powerful because uh, although it has been said, well, it is a one-stop shop, it is pretty close to a one-stop shop without the coronaries, unless you're looking at the origin of the coronaries, but it is really amazing. And for us uh, in this institution, I know Dr. Mamerian, late Dr. Verani, myself, and many others have looked at myocardial viability. It is probably the most powerful the most powerful uh, technology to look at myocardial viability because it's really the only methodology that can look at SCAR, image SCAR, quantify it, as opposed to infer it. Now, at times you need something about the characteristic, the tissue characteristic of the myocardium, but we know that at least if you can image uh, the area of SCAR, uh, replacement SCAR, uh, it, it has an incredible, powerful prognostic as well as therapeutic implication. And this is from Dr. White who visited us a few years ago uh, in Canada looking at fusing the images of the heart of myocardium so you could see the scar down in the lower images uh, superimposed on MRI, which is really beautiful. One area that has been a challenge for us cardiologists is if you don't have replacement scar in a certain area of the myocardium, can you really figure out extracellular space, how much collagen there is, because many of the diastolic dysfunction entities have more interstitial fibrosis. They're stiff for whatever reason. Examples are hypertensive heart disease, aortic stenosis, many other things, the disease of the elderly. And uh, there is a new technology at the bottom there, which is interstitial vibro via extracellular volume fraction, or ECV. And uh, it is a methodology that has been now advocated, I would say close to the past five years or so, gaining more and more traction, and really giving us for the first time an evaluation of what's really going out on the extracellular space, particularly if it is diffuse. So we're not talking about replacement fibrosis, which is on the top. We're looking at what happens to the extracellular volume or extracellular space and what happens with disease, and that's been validated very nicely also. And it has clinical implications, and Dr. Shaw uh, and his colleagues have uh, really uh, published quite a few uh, papers regarding prognostic information, whether this extracellular volume increases and the implications of that. For ischemic heart disease, this is bread and butter. 
and I'm not putting you know MRI here, Dr. Shah, so it's it's no offense for that. But this is the for this institution and most of the institutions in the country, stress testing is still number one for detection of coronary disease because as you know, if you image only at rest, you may not understand that very well. Why? Because there are great adaptive mechanisms to the myocardium. So therefore, you can use an electrocardiogram, uh, much less used, but rediscovered gradually because of insurance companies forcing this on us. Uh, you could use a stress ECG, most likely in few situations where you have a man as opposed to a woman because there are much more false positives in women. And uh, with a p perfectly normal electrocardiogram, even your sensitivity may not be as good, but I think this is a situation where you could but imaging modality, stress, echo, and nuclear. But we still have issues. I think we use them all the time. It's good to keep few things in mind for some of the remaining issues. Bundle branch block is an issue uh, for both technologies. Women may be breast attenuation, but with gating nowadays is less of an issue. Inferior wall, believe it or not, is an issue for most modalities for different reasons. Left ventricular hypertrophy is an issue. If you have severe ischemia, I know Dr. Mamarian would not, uh, uh, would not uh, necessarily bow down and, and say that there is an issue, but at times there is, because uh, th at times there is a, this fixed defect issue. Three vessel disease. There is still an entity of balanced perfusion. So if you have somebody with left main disease, you may want to do a functional test as opposed to a perfusion test. And uh, last but not least, hypertensive response. Anything that tells you about wall motion and, and global function can really give you some false positives or give you a flat. So we still have some issues. And this is where nowadays with CT and geography, you could refine this. Interestingly enough, obviously, CT has progressed so much nowadays, and we'll talk about it later, that radiation has been significantly reduced, and we've been fortunate to be able to have such a scanner. And in addition, contrast has been, the amount of contrast has been reduced so much so that, and that could be a shocker for you, in England, in the United Kingdom, the last month, the NICE guidelines, NICE for the national, NICE guidelines came up with as almost a first line investigation for individuals with chest pain would be CT and geography. Controversial, obviously will send them ripples and a lot of, but just to tell you where things have evolved over time, over the past 10, 15 years, is that with that much less reduction in radiation, much less contrast, that there are situations where conceivably you could go for CT and geography as your first one. Now, remember also that coronary disease is a progressive thing. And, uh, and the functional tests, most of them, be it wall motion or functional, will only detect uh, things way down where you're in the 60% or above range. We always talk about 50% stenosis, but to tell you the truth, most of the time you're going to detect them somewhere closer to the 70% range if there are no collaterals and other things. So if you're really serious about uh, prevention of disease and early, very early detection of disease, you have to look at, you know, the left side of this graph uh, where you're seeing the earliest deposition of, of cholesterol, plaque, and its reaction, which is calcific depo deposits at this stage of the game. And, and this is where calcium scoring and this institution with Dr. Mamarian, Sumin Chang, and Faisal Nabi have really the, been the pioneers uh, to go forward. And this is from their publication. And at times you say, hmm, an individual came in, had a normal stress test, normal stress nuclear, and uh, within three days, four days, whatever it is, had an acute myocardial infarction. How could that be? That's the first question from a patient point of view. And, uh, but we know that if you have burden of disease that is non-stenotic, any fissure, any alteration in in a structure that could trigger a thrombotic phenomenon could cause an acute myocardial infarction. And this was the impetus here of adding a calcium score to a normal stress test. And tells you that with a higher calcium score, 
that indeed your prognosis is, is a bit different than if you had either a very little calcium score, basically a little burden of disease as opposed to more burden of disease. So comes something that besides being a silo of investigation, meaning, oh, my perfusion test is, is uh, uh, normal. Therefore, my prognosis is just wonderful. What I'm going to push you, and you will see some of the data, is go beyond a single test result to assess prognosis. Because the more inclusive you are of other risk factors, really the closer you are at, as to predicting what the overall prognosis of a particular individual is. And yes, we have vascular, right? And um, uh, we have a wonderful vascular laboratory here, but you know, that can tell you uh, also about burden of disease. There is a correlation, but not a one-to-one -one correlation between vascular disease and coronary disease, but certainly there's a correlation. So uh, I would push you towards identifying total risk as opposed to a risk from either a stress test or a resting echocardiogram and other things. So it is cumulative. Risk factors are still very important because you're looking at long term. You're not only looking at tomorrow. The cardiac phenotype. What phenotype are we talking about? Are there coronary calcifications in somebody who's completely asymptomatic? Hypertrophy, global regional function, diastolic properties, exercise tolerance, right? Stress-induced ischemia. So the closer you are to assessing total risk, the better feel you have of a particular patient. Because particular patient, if, if, uh, if they're not doing well, they really don't care why they're not doing well from which vascular bed or otherwise. The prognosis is very important. And along these lines comes this publication just a month or two ago. Again, this is machine learning, okay? <coughs> machine learning. Uh, amazing, actually, using two things. CT angiography as well as clinical data, okay? And this is the confirmed trial, prospective multicenter, 10,000 patients, duration five years, 44 CT parameters. So it's not whether there's only one, many characteristics about what the lesion is, and 25 clinical parameters. And, you know, this is an example there. But the most important thing is the graph on the right. Is from prediction of the model. So this is machine, you, know, this is, you get as much information about the patient from one anatomic to some clinical characteristics. Put them together, okay? And this ROC curve in red is machine learning, an AUC of 0.8. Below it is, you know what this one is, right? Is the Framingham Risk Score Index. And see, see where the blue is compared to the red. And the other ones are basically parameters from the CT angio alone. Okay? To tell you that the more inclusive you are of other parameters, obviously it can get complicated for the particular individual to kind of put one plus one together. But this is machine learning. And it enties so much Dr. Jim Min uh, to actually dedicate only 20% of his time nowadays, and this is recent, at uh, Cornell, to do the regular stuff. And 80% will be involved in startup companies to look at machine learning and how can they improve our overall prognostic implications, et cetera. And actually, if you look at that model, the observed more, uh, mace as well as the predicted mace were almost right on. Very exciting. Very exciting. Valve disease, you know, I, I think you know where the implications of valve heart disease and imaging. Echocardiography since its start from the early, early days in the 60s, believe it or not, and 70s. Uh, Dr. Winters was involved in, in that from the early days and has evolved so much nowadays that you have 3D imaging, you can predict gradients, you, you can do so many things, and it is a first line for echocardiography. Yet we have issues. 
And I think if you tell me where the big issue is, and I'm revising the guideline uh, for, for detection or quantitation of valve regurgitation, hopefully it will be out in January. Uh, we can have a grand rounds on that. Uh, where are the issues? The issues are in valve regurgitation, much more than stenosis, and more mitral issue as opposed to aortic regurgitation. And uh, particularly now with the entity of ischemic mitral regurgitation and so many other things that we don't have answers. I really think we need to do more research, and I think we are planning actually a big database. Here with Dr. Shaw, Dr. Naga, Dr. Little, and so many others to try to, you know, have a go at it, a something strong that we could develop going forward to try to improve that and decrease variability. One thing, though, that we can do nowadays is, you know, quantitate many things about the mitral valve, other valves, but mitral valve is, is quite interesting because of its pathology as well as its prognostic information of acute rupture, prolapse, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And we're going from just pure description of what the size of the valve is to look at its function. And this is work now has been, I would say, uh, in the making for about seven, eight years in collaboration with University of Houston, Dr. Azincott. Uh, we'll give a research seminar on that next week. And uh, it is quite revealing because for this is for the first time uh, in man, uh, in a handful of patients and normal individuals, quantitating strain on the mitral valve itself and hopefully trying to figure out whether this is, is, is prognostically important. Uh, what does surgery mitral valve repair do for the mitral valve regarding strain? This is a patient with uh, mitral valve prolapse, as you could see it nicely prolapsing there, and then you could track it during the cardiac cycle so you look at strain and stress of the mitral valve itself. You could map it, and this is from a normal valve on the left, and you could see much higher strain. Usually strain is higher in the posterior leaflet compared to the anterior leaflet, and we've compared them in normals versus organic mitral valve, and certainly they're quite different. Uh, it's interesting that strain localizes at the commissures and the annulus that you could see there and at the point of coaptation as opposed to the body of the mitral valve itself. And you could see those highlighted in black. And we've also, and there is a publication in review now in CERC Imaging, looking at pre and post repair. The reduction in strain is quite significant. So this is with Dr. Lowry's technique of mitral valve preservation. So the mitral valve is really not cut. You have annular reduction and <clears throat> artificial cordae that are placed. And with that, just decreasing the size of the mitral valve and increasing coaptation at the tip of the leaflet, strain is reduced significantly. And whether that is a major advantage in the long-term prognosis, I think still to be determined, but I think this is, this, this is very novel. Actually, we have collaborations coming up with industry to try to see how can we you know, push this and investigate it in so many other areas. Uh, interventional imaging over the past 10 years really has come here. I mean, it was not there, and this is because of the collaboration and the need for collaboration at a heart team in the catheterization laboratory with all the newer structural heart disease interventions. Started with TAVR, and nowadays TAVR probably needs much less transesophageal imaging as opposed to transthoracic. However, there are many others that still need transesophageal. This is mitral valve clip, and I think it's crucial, no matter what, uh, for the mitral valve particularly, for the clip itself, and also most likely for the newer total mitral valve replacement as to the implications of that. So imaging in the catheterization in, in interventional laboratory is indeed crucial. Same thing for left atrial appendage closure, same thing for paravalvular defects where you really need to know where the catheter is going, put plugs uh, with the occluders deployed and, um, and uh, basically uh, relieve some of that regurgitation and particularly in the individual who's at a much higher risk of, of uh, repeat surgery. And uh, this is TAVR implantation from the early days and we still have some issues with TAVR, much less than before regarding paravalvular regurgitation. And uh, you know, there's still some lingering questions regarding valvular disease. Uh, what's the best methodology? Uh, what's stress and strain? We talked about that, the role of 3D printing and uh, towards personalized valve. And I think these answers 
uh, these questions and answers have been trying to be tackled by our team uh, headed by Dr. Little in in vitro modeling. This has taken, Steve, about maybe five years or so to develop an amazing chamber that can simulate left atrium, left ventricle, uh, that is echo compatible, so you could see it from multiple uh, areas, and as well as MRI compatible. This is the the uh, original team here. Uh, Steve Igo has been an amazing individual, you know, shepherding all these technological issues in addition to engineers, etc. And uh, and I think all of that nowadays can be uh, really uh, evaluated, being putting a tissue valve or studying hemodynamics and many other things and. I think Steve and Steve, uh, Steve Little and Steve Igo have been phenomenal in assembling an, a, an amazing team, looking at uh, you know these investigations. But at the crux of this, again, is imaging to study structure, function, uh, and uh, and and you will see this patient-specific modeling of imaging that has been spearheaded. And I think we're among really the leaders of of three D printing, taking high resolution images from CT scans, let's say for the aortic valve, and then 3D printing the aortic valve and the LV alpha tract as well as the proximal aorta with different characteristics. So calcifications have different printing characteristics than, than regular muscle or other tissue that is much more pliable. And you could really simulate not only what the valve looks like, but also you can simulate it from a functional point of view. And this is uh, calcific aortic, stenation, aortic stenosis from a, an individual patient on the left side, and this is the model on the right side, and not only from a structural point of view, but also from a functional point of view. Uh, they are very similar, and this has been published in, in Jack you know, as of recent. Uh, bigger, bigger opportunities, I would say, uh, would be for the other valves, mitral and hopefully tricuspid down the line, as to what do they look like, so how you can approach them best with either a clip or a total valve replacement. And uh, I think uh, this has been really pioneered by Dr. Little, Eleonora, Maria, and, and the whole team that has been here to, uh, to, to look at that and you know, assess how best to understand the anatomy as well as physiology of the valve. So going from a clinical experience, high resolution imaging, patient-specific 3D material and going back and trying to refine that. All that is fine and dandy. All that has been really exciting and phenomenal, but reality at times sets in, right? Because there is tremendous growth, but there is a lot of pressure. And uh, there is a lot of pressure because, you know, separate talk for obviously cardiovascular economics and, and health economics in the nation. But Part of, part of the concern from industry, government, and everything else, healthcare system here is this is the graph of either cardiology or overall radiology utilization of CT, MR, and PET in this country. So from 1995 to 2005, an exponential growth. And the concern is, is this all appropriate? Is this all health, health care dollars driven? Uh, what is, obviously, many things have occurred, obviously, in our field. I'll give you an example. You know, atrial fibrillation was a disease that nobody looked at. But nowadays, you have interventions, you have so many other things that require imaging. Patients with heart failure, much more prominent nowadays, diastolic heart failure. So you may need some echocardiography, not necessarily high-end or advanced imaging. But this is what prompted, believe it or not, the appropriate use criteria. This conversation prompted the appropriate use criteria because there was seemingly overutilization of imaging. And, you know, the uh, ACC uh, was, you know, quite uh, present with that, uh, as well as American College of Radiology took that on for imaging purposes to try to at least translate guidelines into something that would be appropriate conceivably or you know maybe appropriate or rarely appropriate situations now do people read every little portion of it most likely not but what you will see and gradually see is that part of macra and that's a different you, you need to know that acronym 
and I think we're going to have some symposia about it because this is value, quality injected into your practice. Part of that, part of taking away this SGR was an agreement that you would use appropriate use criteria to order a test. So at the point of order, you just not say, I want an echocardiogram and I want a CT scan. You need to justify why, for all reasons, for all good appropriate reasons, but you will see some of this being incorporated into your ordering system, not to make it you know, onerous, but I think in a way appropriate, and hopefully you will find the language for that to be, to be so. Based on many things, including, and I, including one appropriate use criteria, in addition to decrease in reimbursement, and that's what caused the shift of physicians you know, to being employed, believe it or not, particularly for cardiology, you see a gradual reduction and leveling off of utilization of echocardiography, MRI, CT, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously it has a natural growth because the population is growing. So you'll see a reaction first and a gradual, hopefully some flattening of the curve, more appropriateness of the curve. So what are, what are the trends? Well, imaging, there's no question, I think everybody acknowledges, is crucial for healthcare delivery. And cost effectiveness and value are becoming part of our language. And believe it or not, they will need to be part of your language. If you don't think about it, just wake up. You need to wake up because uh, it is not just an onerous look at what you do. Everybody is looking at what you do. You could be in, completely in private practice. You could be in an integrated group. You could be wherever you are. Your utilization patterns are transparent and you just need to do what's appropriate. That's all. You don't have to be defensive medicine. You just do what is appropriate, what is clinically appropriate. There's more emphasis on quality. There are umpteen quality measures. Multimodality imaging is great in a way, <clears throat> but it's adding complexity. I'm pretty sure that we'll have quite a bit of heterogeneity of how do you approach a particular patient with what kind of test among this group here. So just imagine if you take this and put it in the context of healthcare for primary care doctors and other doctors of what to order. And I do hope, and I would encourage people to say, well, if I don't know what test to order, just give us a call. Give the lab a call. At times I call a radiologist just to see, well, I have this issue. What is the best test for this individual? And I think this is important, almost like a consultative way of looking at it. And healthcare models and, and payments are changing. They're already changing. This is no longer theoretical, right? Uh, you know that for cardio, I started with orthopedics, but for cardiology, there are you know, two areas that will be targeted for bundled payment beyond the hospital stay, right? Coronary artery bypass surgery is one, and PCI procedures for acute myocardial infarction. So you have to think beyond the episode of care that has you know, admitted this, in, in this individual to the hospital. Uh, so if you have your lens going into the future, what will be? I uh, just want to tell you how fast things are. 15 years ago, the genome was not cloned, right? So it used to be early on about almost a million dollars to clone a genome. Nowadays, it's about between $1,000 and $2,000. Things have changed. Uh, there were no, I mean, CT scan was in its infancy. There was no real-time 3D echo. Uh, had no social media, believe it or not. Nowadays, you can't live without it, can you? <laughs> um, you're at the iPhone 7 as of yesterday, and many of you did not like you know, probably the jack not being there. If you don't know that, wake up today, you're gonna use some wireless. But, uh, but believe it or not, I mean, this is now, if you take, if you take your, your phone away, you're lost, right? And this is 15 years. So it'll be hard to predict what the future is like, but I'll give you a glimpse. One is, there is no question that is an amazing digital revolution. You could, I mean, Eric Topol has made a, a new career in, in looking at digital things, and, and, uh, but it's out there. 
There's no question about it. And it's touching our lives every day in so many ways, right? Epic is here. Epic and the outpatients here. Wireless technology, you name it, social media. This is last month. Last month. There are, from virtual nurses to drug discovery, 90 plus artificial intelligence startup in healthcare. 90 plus. You know how much investment there is. And imaging is in it, as I told you. But it's, it's total healthcare. So you have to think about that. Another thing that you have to think about <clears throat> is what's going on at the patient level. Patients are smarter. They use smartphones. But they, they are smarter in many ways. And connectivity is gradually there. I mean, we, we get frustrated because, you know, they do so many things and you can't connect them. But connectivity is getting here. You may or may not know about this. <clears throat> you know about this X Prize, $10 million for people who can come up with a handheld device that can give about 15 diagnoses with patients. 200 plus companies involved. The winner will be announced early next year. All right? So just keep that in mind. Yet, yet, our physicians we as physicians, what do we do at the bedside? We use a famous stethoscope that is about you know, 200 years old. Uh, the stethoscope has uh, nowadays for us aging and the aging group is uh, having amplifiers and, uh, and other things. But let me tell you, it is diagnosis on the fly, right? And uh, no documentation. And uh, from that, you know, you could order whatever test, uh, and I'm telling you that the art of this is, uh, is gone. Now, before the art was gone, uh, this is your diagnostic accuracy at the bedside, internal medicine, family medicine, medical students, below 30% usually. Mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, aortic insufficiency, whatever it is. I think it's still important, believe it or not. Uh, stethoscope, you may not think about it, but that's how I think about it. It's a 4D instrument that is not, does not need to be charged, <laughs> okay? But it's a 4D instrument because sound is in 3D space and uh, you have time with it. And believe it or not, even with echocardiography, you can miss a VSD, a VSD, if you don't have it in the right plane. And I know it happened twice in my career here where I had to ask the sonographer because either somebody is too sick or whatever it is to go back to the bedside and get other views and the ventricular septal defect is there. So it's a great screener, but at least learn how to use it, not to tell me what if, this, if the uh, opening snap is uh, within 30 milliseconds of, of the second heart sound or so, but at least use it well. So, and now we have equipment. We have portable equipment that I can tell you we're not using. And in negotiations with administration, with, with Roberta Schwartz and others, uh, we will likely implement within the next year or so, and I know, I don't know if Angie is here, McDonald, our fierce leader uh, in the imaging laboratory, uh, is that we will equip some services with some of these portable ultrasound to help you navigate. You don't have to be an expert, but at least answer simple questions that you may not need to have a full echocardiogram. We have the technology available, and I think we have to use it appropriately. But individuals have to know what they're doing. Otherwise, you know, it will be a, a real mess. It will be overutilization of what really happens. So it, it will be worse than a stethoscope. Uh, you know, a few years ago, I had uh, this idea about an omniscope where you can, you know, put things together electronically, et cetera, is still under development. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see the, the light at some point in time. But this small miniaturization can help you really address the masses. And um, this was, believe it or not, from the American Society of Echocardiography going to India and uh, winning a Guinness Book World Record of uh, evaluating more than a thousand patients after a quick stethoscope you know, 
sending them to the appropriate little echocardiogram and being able to help more than a thousand patients you know within 48 hours believe it or not just imagine i mean the teams and these were interpreted globally there were volunteers throughout the world you know trying to interpret this and it was really amazing other things that are just amazingly exciting in imaging is if you take a look at, at this here uh, this is mri 4d flow uh, the images of flow are are just amazing and this is in the 3d space and this is from examples from Dr. Shah and uh, Hugh Whelan, our director of adult congenital heart disease. This is uh, pulmonic insufficiency, and you could see it on the right side, how the flow is. Now we can learn quite a bit of that, of what it means going forward. A PDA on the left side with an Eisenmenger, a secundum atrial septal defect on the right that uh, can tell us about flows. And I don't know where this will take us. It may take us in so many different directions, but for the first time, you could really visualize where the actual flow red cells are going and tell you about maybe a remodeling of the heart, stress of the heart, uh, when to operate on an individual, particularly with adult congenital heart disease. I'm also proud to announce that, you know, within the past few days, there was a new grant approved, which is a collaboration between the University of Houston and us here under the leadership uh, of Dr. Deepenshaw. Tell you the truth, I don't understand it very well. But all what I understand is amazing. This is futuristic therapeutic interventions where you could deploy a few things, all right, and within the body, activate it with MRI so that it can reconstitute as well as do a targeted intervention. Uh, was felt to be certainly worthwhile to give it almost a million dollars. And, uh, and this is a tremendous collaboration because taking technologies to a different forefront, I think it, it really is exciting in the realm of therapeutic intervention. I have not left our nuclear folks, you know, to dry. And uh, PET actually is, is really on the rise, particularly with some new pharma, pharma, uh, pharmaceutical that have an advantage over everything else we have nowadays. Not yet in the clinic, but certainly being tested in the clinic at this stage of the game. This is fluorpyridase, which is in the orange bar, is the only agent, is the only agent in nuclear cardiology that tracks flow one-to-one -one almost, meaning that I know what flow is in a certain particular bed one-to-one -one, as opposed to have a threshold phenomenon, just like you see with maybe orthalium. So a tremendous advantage over the others if clinically approved. Images are really gorgeous. So you could, you could see the, the images very nicely, and this is from uh, Dr. Dan Berman, who provided this for us. Uh, the other thing is inflammation and atherosclerosis using PET. And we're actively looking of hiring somebody to complement our uh, our cardiovascular imaging institute with such a, an interest and expertise uh, because in acute coronary syndromes and early atherosclerosis, it is accompanied by inflammation. And nowadays, you could target almost any step of the atherosclerotic process with particular agents. And we have to take advantage of a cyclotron that is available here with imaging technologies that are available close by for us to be able to do that. I talked to you about the CT, the dual source CT that we've acquired last year. And this has been a game changer. I can tell you, this has been a game changer. And the reason for it, besides low radiation dose, low contrast, and you could image individuals who are you know, thin enough, less than one millisiever, is that uh, this technology is so powerful that uh, it, can, it is fast, it has a very fast temporal resolution so that we don't have to wait so long for individuals to be beta blocked or even image them at a heart rate of 60 or so. Dr. Mamarian can tell you that flow of patients, their satisfaction of not being there in the lab waiting for their heart rate to go so low, uh, and also from a safety point of view, there's no question about it, that, that it has been a game changer. One-fifth to one-tenth the usual dose of radiation with pristine images going forward. And this is Tavares scan time, 1.4 seconds. 
to be able to image the whole heart, aorta, calcium, vessels, etc., etc. And last but not least <clears throat> is um, really an amazing development going forward uh, with CT also at the same time. <clears throat> this is utilization of computational fluid dynamics, trying to understand cardiac physiology, coronary physiology beyond what coronary anatomy is. And uh, amazing individuals got together, uh, graduates of Stanford. Now there is a company for that. And uh, I know you may not think that it is real, but it is real and has yet to be tested on a much larger scale, has been tested in, in trials. <clears throat> the real thing is that depending on the anatomy of the heart, the vessels, their size, their caliber, where the coronary stenosis is, are there serial stenosis, yes or no? Understanding fluid dynamics and without giving a flow vasodilator like adenosine, you can predict what FFR is, what fractional flow reserve is. Um, interesting, challenging, right? But so far, so good. <clears throat> Only one company can do that. And uh, obviously, you can contract with them, etc and have this available. But I think it is very interesting because from just baseline anatomy, you can predict what the flow characteristics would be at baseline and during stress, which is really amazing. And going forward, can you do something like this? Can you do virtual stenting where I can take the fractional flow reserve from 0.6 and if I put Theoretically, I put a stent and dilate it for a particular size, <clears throat> keeping everything else the same. What really happens to fractional flow reserve and maybe telling you about whether, not only whether you should early on, but depending on the anatomy, whether you'll get a significant benefit of dilating or putting a stent in that particular artery. Really exciting, and I think uh, the, this is a, certainly very fruitful for research going on. So if I want to put things together, I think there are tremendous opportunities and still some challenges in the cardiovascular imaging arena. Uh, I think it has touched every area of cardiology and cardiovascular medicine. And from high-end molecular imaging, big devices that can give us a lot of function as well as structure, to even miniaturized handheld devices that can be used in the field, whatever the field is, believe it or not, and in low-cost situations. Uh, you only have to go to China and, uh, and India and find out what the, what, the, what the challenges are to delivering care in the most populous areas in the world. But, you know, we're not immune to that. We still have our own challenges here. Detection of early disease, cardiovascular phenotype, this is really the way to go, and nowadays with more and more safety issues. Uh, that we've, uh, what we've uh, conquered, I think it's becoming less of an issue. Possible use of imaging for novel drug development as well as surrogate for patient outcome. Uh, I think we have to go be realistic also that anytime you're going to adopt any new technology, uh, it has to show some, some effect. And the value is, be it safety, patient care, efficiency nowadays, uh, workflow, uh, and certainly outcome I think would be great for patients. A caution to us, and I've seen it, and I, I do hope that I know we're an academic institution, but I would avoid as much layering of multi and think about the, the process of what test would you use now that you have many choices and avoid as much as possible, and we do that with fellow conferences, is I'll start with an echo and get maybe a stress nuclear, but the stress nuclear is you know, conceivable there and get a CTA, and after a CTA, conceivably get a, an angiogram. And uh, I don't think you've done, you've done any good deed for neither the patient nor you know, the healthcare environment. So think about that. Identify best and cost-effective approaches to disease detection and management in a digital and multimodality imaging world. And I think you will see something new coming up within the next five to 10 years. It's machine learning to help you. 
and the machine learning is not only to interpret a certain test, imaging test, is to put it in the context of a particular patient, hopefully for better management, better prognostication, and better overall outcome using you know, our healthcare system. And at this time, it, it's nice to think back a little bit. This is about 10 years ago. Uh, I usually showed this, uh, and I, I kept showing it because uh, we looked so young. <laughs> um, you know, the hair was darker, uh, the face was tight, and, uh, but, the, the, <laughs> but, uh, but this, was, this was our team, you know, 10 plus years ago. And uh, this was a vision that uh, I'm, I'm so happy that the uh, Houston Methodist administration and vision really gelled together to put this uh, to, to reality. And to tell you the truth, we are the envy of many institutions in this country. It is unique where you have under one roof all cardiovascular imaging modality from a education, research, as well as you know, patient perspective. And uh, the team has grown. And um, this is you know, dated two days ago. Um, uh, yeah, our hair is a little wider. Uh, but, uh, but we have an amazing team. We really do have an amazing team that from all our specialists, from a cardiology point of view, cardiovascular specialist, uh, our administrative team is amazing with you know, Angie McDonald as, as, the, as the lead person. And uh, you, can't, you can't aspire for a better collaborative team. I really tell you. And uh, we're not the only the envy of uh, many people in this part of the world and, and many other parts of the world, but also we're so proud uh, to be able to put together such a team that can influence uh, the field uh, for betterment of understanding of cardiovascular disease, hopefully it's prevention, but most importantly, taking better care of patients. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share that with you. Well, you've been gifted with a remarkable uh, story about imaging in this institution. It may be a question or two, but I'd like to give you one teaspoonful of bit of history before, uh, before you ask questions. Uh, the, ed education, the Imaging Institute as it is today didn't happen by accident. Uh, the first, the echocardiography laboratory in this hospital began in 1968 and was the first one in this part of the country. And shortly thereafter, within several years, nuclear uh, cardiology was instituted by one of my partners, uh, Dick Cashin. They tried to put it in our office, our private office, uh, very quickly we realized it was a bad mistake and it was moved to the Methodist Hospital where it was then developed by Dr. Reduto and, and Mario Verani through the years and now John Mamarian. The person who put it all together and kept it within the Department of Cardiology was Dr. Gatto. Uh, in those days many of these uh, modalities were, were part of the radiology department in most institutions and they defended the right to do those uh, tremendously. So it was really Dr. Gatto who, who managed to, to harness all of these is, uh, modalities as they developed within the Department of Cardiology. And then uh, uh, from that point on, uh, Dr. Kononis and Dr. Zogby and others have carried it forward to where it is now. So uh, uh, Dr. Gatto was really the father of the Last Institute for as it stands now. So, any questions? Yes, yeah, hey, Dr. Bill, look, uh, superb grand rounds, as expected. Very daunting for those of us who are on the schedule later on in the year. How on earth are we going to come close to this? Uh, let me challenge you on something. Um, and you're known to do that, Dr. Kleiman, uh, and we're happy I'm to known, oblige. But, you know, <laughs> that's why you keep me around. Exactly. So you showed uh, some very nice uh, stress and strain images of the mitral valve. And it occurred to me that strain is a biomarker. 
we can do a lot to reduce strain and make the pictures look better. So you know where I'm going. We've learned this you know, with other biomarkers in patients. An example is TNF-alpha, pathophysiologic finding. Give an antibody to block it, and you increase rather than decrease heart failure mortality. Uh, transfusion in patients uh, on dialysis, you make them worse, not better, even though their hemoglobin looks better. How uh, is your community, as a group of imagers, going to be able to distinguish between biomarkers that we chase and clinical indicators of things we ought to be doing? I mean, this is a very important question. Obviously, we're at the, at the beginning stages, and uh, you won't believe how long it took for us to get where we are. It took, realistically, about seven years to be able to do this. And a part of it was the mathematical development of it, tracking of the mitral valve, being able to assign where the mitral valve structure is moving in, in space, which is difficult. Uh, we're hoping to have some collaboration with, and, and part of it is also tagging of the valve, et cetera. So in the next year, and we've had you know, people already involved in it. Carlos is here, is going to be with us for two years working on it. We're hoping within the next year to automate most of that so that we're able to test it in much larger populations, normal, any mitral valve, abnormalities, post-surgery, et cetera, to be able to see what the clinical information, does it relate to any clinical information? So strain is telling us something about one, the elastic properties or the properties of that mitral valve itself in health and disease. Does it relate to prognosis? Most likely, yes, but we don't know at this stage of the game. Uh, there are also structural things, how large the mitral valve is, because in mitral valve prolapse, for example, the annulus is much larger, even without regurgitation, and it's data from Dr. Little. Uh, you know, the mitral valve most likely has higher strain itself, so that most likely adds to the prognosis because with strain and for, for some pressure comes higher stress. And therefore, there is some relation there. And this is, I think, would be the next five years or so to be able to Yeah, I mean, the, I chose strain as an example, but obviously it's not limited to that. You have the potential to find hundreds, if not thousands, of biomarkers, although they're mathematical models. And, and there needs to be a way or I hope you can find a way uh, to distinguish them from uh, being simple biomarkers to becoming targets. So, other questions? Dr. Sakwi, thank you so much for that amazing, amazing future, uh, glimpse into the future. I think that um, in nowhere in, in cardiovascular medicine do we have more challenges in the, than the realm of pulmonary hypertension and heart failure. And, and one thing that really captured uh, 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 my interest and, and, and excitement is uh, the potential to utilize the um, uh, virtual uh, application of what an intervention could be, such, that, such as when we uh, treat patients with CTEF, with either surgical or non-surgical means, I mean, we still struggle as to risk stratification, who would benefit from this really invasive modality. I mean, I think the application and future thereof is incredible. And I was wondering if you can comment, are there any um, currently people looking at application of this into, other than coronary disease, maybe going into the, the vascular realm between the heart and the lung? Let me tell you, I think that would be a tremendous application because uh, if what I shared with you on virtual stenting, for example, could be applied, I'm pretty sure that they're thinking about it, but their main target at this stage is coronary disease. But if you have such a vasculature issue, and if you go after it and remove whatever it is, uh, in addition to everything else you have from a from you know pulmonary uh, arterial or properties, et cetera, et cetera, can you predict whether an intervention would be helpful, yes or no? I, I think it would be, would be great. It would help, certainly, the field. I don't know if it's feasible, but I think, at least theoretically, it could be feasible. And, and just like in the valve uh, uh, world, I know there's a, um, interest in informing a surgical and non-surgical uh, approach and perhaps utilizing this to guide, you know, in which area to target as we look at, you know, both forms of intervention to really uh, best 
uh, restore the flow and, and function to the right heart. I mean, I think that is incredible, incredibly exciting. Here you go. Bill, that, that was fabulous and clearly makes us all feel very proud. Um, two things. One was the, um, what you showed about uh, machine learning. I really hope it moves fast enough so that when I'm getting a little slower in the lab, that machine will help me <laughs> not make any big mistakes. But <laughs> more seriously, you touched on two interesting um, opposite sides of, of the situation. One is how... <clears throat> Multi information, getting more information by more than one imaging modality stacked with clinical information may push us real forward in understanding disease better, predicting outcomes and whatnot. Then on the other side of the spectrum, whoa, careful, too much testing is going to cost a lot of money and create issues. This balance obviously is going to be one of our challenges. And I just mentioned this because I think this is one of the greatest opportunities we have for our fellows to get involved because very few places in the country have what we have. And I think being able to manage that balance of at times multiple information is crucial versus redundant information is going to be one of the most important things we navigate over the next five years. And I think we like to encourage the young people here to really get into one of those areas because that could be uh, breaking news in the next few well, years. What I'd like to emphasize though, um, it's not necessarily a dilemma of this and this. It is taking the current information, the current information, which is at times is voluminous, and putting it together. And the two examples I have for you is one, this confirmed uh, study, that the trial that was done, basically is taking CT, but with 22 variables within CT. And the clinical information was whatever it is, 30, 40, 50 clinical information. So they're available already. And how are you going to put them together? Another simple example is when you read a stress, an exercise echocardiogram for the clinician, I always look at, so this is the same. You could take a look at that normal study and then move on, <laughs> right? Or you could look and say, Hmm. Normal heart at baseline, function-wise, normal during exercise. What happened to exercise tolerance, right? Somebody exercises only for three, six minutes versus stage four. Very different prognosis of an individual. What happened to the EKG? Believe it or not, the electrocardiogram is still prognostically important even in the whole milieu of a normal stress echocardiogram. So if you tell me I exercised 12 minutes, I have very little, I mean, hopefully not very little risk because you don't need a stress echocardiogram. I had no hypertrophy, normal chamber size, normal stress, normal, normal everything. Your prognosis is very different. So th this is not machine learning. This is comprehensive learning <laughs> versus just looking at said, is it normal? Yes, no. All right, I think it's, it's getting late. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was superb.